Hey everyone, welcome back to the lab. Uh, in this video, we're gonna be reading your programming language benchmark is wrong. Now this is a new format I'm trying where I'm just gonna try to read some things, kind of react, think it'll be interesting to kind of give more like free form thoughts as we um, go through some of this stuff. Now this one's a little meta. I did write this post, uh, but I was too lazy to actually make a video on it. So we're just gonna read it here instead. If you wanna read it uh, as a blog post, I'll also have the link uh, in the description so you can grab that. So yeah, I know this title is like pretty spicy. I actually uh, tried to get ChatGPT to give me a few different alternatives to this title, but ultimately this title, which I, I created myself, was the spiciest um, of all the ideas ChatGPT gave me. So I decided to stick with it. All right, let's get into it. So programming language benchmarks like Tech and Power, Web Benchmarks, and Benchmark Game utilize standardized test scenarios to try and determine which programming language is faster and easier. So I don't know if you've used these, but uh, if you've been following along, I do a lot of like little um, benchmarks, and I, I often like go back to these. Tech and Power is like the uh, you know standard industry one um, where you got a lot of like industry players from like C++ and Rust and you know .NET coming in to try a bunch of different test types. Um, web Frameworks Benchmark is a more simple one that's really focused on like web requests um, on kind of like more reasonable frameworks that you might actually use in your day to day. And if I filter down to F sharp here, uh, I actually did some work on the giraffe and giraffe endpoints ones. I'm um, gonna have some posts on that too if you wanna go check those out. And then this one is like the de facto one that a lot of people people reference, but I'll be honest, I've never really understood how this whole thing works. And it's really hard to use. Um, so I, I rarely use benchmarks game, but a lot of people reference it. So so I referenced it here. So anyway, yeah, a lot of these benchmarks that, that people are using. Um, many software engineers, myself included, this is a link to my benchmark, uh, if you want to look at that, um, reference these benchmarks when comparing and choosing languages for project. The problem with these benchmarks is that they're all missing a key thing necessary to understand the true speed of a programming language. To find out what this is, we need to answer a different more broad question. What is speed with respect to a programming language? Now, I actually find that this um, idea that like we make all these like micro benchmarks and things to answer a question, but then if you actually want to find the real answer to the question, you need to back up and ask a different question is pretty common. Um, and it usually just comes down to asking like, why are we doing this? Or what are we actually trying to solve? And that leads to like a better question. So that's kind of what I did. Um, I'm here to try and, and frame uh, this post a little bit better. Performance. Okay, so the obvious answer is performance or how fast can the language do operations like math or respond to web requests which power your favorite websites um so if you looked at the benchmarks uh, before i think like benchmarks game is more like mathy doing all sorts of like core algorithm stuff and comparing the different implementations of languages and then for web requests this is more like what tech empower and the web frameworks benchmark benchmarks are doing which i think is more useful for more people because more systems are just doing web requests anyway this is the approach that most benchmarks take yep so that's what most benchmarks take. So this is a valid answer. It makes a lot of sense as it's certainly a large factor you want to be aware of when choosing a language, at least to avoid the deal breaking slow ones. Yeah, I, I largely agree with this um, because like you'll often see these benchmarks and there's kind of like this, it's almost like this power curve thing, right? Where it's like at the top is gonna be like your C++, Zig, Rust code. You're gonna look in there. It's gonna be like ridiculous, like probably some bit shifting and all sorts of things you would never actually write in a real system. Um, and then you'll get to the mid ones, which are like usually more reasonable. Like you'll get like your C sharp, your Java, your Go, um, which looks a little bit better though. Often those, they also do stupid bit shifting. Don't do that. Don't do the bit shifting. Um, and then you'll come down to the other side where it's like, I don't know, the weird language is like Ruby or uh, Elixir, I think is actually pretty bad at a lot of these like hard operations um, outside of like web system, um, things like that. But I think for the most part, like when you're using this to choose, for the most part, you just want, one that's not the bad ones and any of the other ones are, are kind of fine. Um, anyway, plus it's relatively easy to implement. Um, you'd think it's actually quite hard. Fair test and compare the results. Yeah, so I think it's so easy. It's kind of like watching the Olympics where it's so easy to like point things that are wrong out. But if you're actually doing the thing, it's actually really hard. Um, and so a lot of these benchmarks, there's like obvious things that are wrong or there's there's things that you might learn in each implementation are a little bit wrong. But it's actually really hard to make it super objective and fair across all of the um, benchmarks. So I really uh, admire and um, feel for the, the maintainers of these things because they're doing great work um, and they're getting like 
<laughs> no love usually. Uh, they're really only just hearing from people that like your benchmark sucks, um, which is not fair because <laughs> I don't think we could probably build a better benchmark, um, at least not without like significant effort. Anyway, so it's unfair to say that these benchmarks are wrong or doing the wrong thing, though all benchmarks have asterisks. Um, I talked about this a lot in a previous blog post, so check that out if you're interested. Um, and they're doing a reasonable thing reasonably well, but it doesn't really mean that much in reality. The reason these benchmarks don't hold up when theory meets reality is that the things they're measuring are rarely the bottleneck in today's software. Yeah, so here's some examples. Um, horizontal and vertical scaling is easy in the cloud. Um, yeah, I basically found for most cases, you can either horizontally or vertically scale yourself out of a problem up to like several million DAU. Um, the cloud makes it really easy. And obviously you only wanna do this if you're making money, but if you have a tool like with this much load on it, you could probably make money off of it. And if you're not like, I don't know, go check your, your monetization strategy. Um, hot slow paths can largely be resolved with caches and moving heavy ops off blocking path. Yeah, this is a huge one. Like I think a lot of performance bottlenecks are not really the pro programming language. So that's like definitely a factor that everything lies on top of, but you can basically just re-architect most things to make it not that bad. Like the real world's um, parallel I always think about is like the elevator uh, idea where it's like, you know, elevators can only go so fast safely and like whatever. And so what they found is that if they just put mirrors in the elevator room, people think the elevators are going faster, but actually it's just a perception issue where they like are looking at themselves. So the elevator is going the same speed, but they think it's faster because they're not paying attention. I think this is largely the same as software. You can do all sorts of things like off peak and like away and cache things use kind of stale results and it feels fast, even if it's not fast, but the user doesn't need to know. Um, side note, Instagram, we did this all the time. Like all those photos and videos you're seeing on Instagram, those have to be downloaded. I worked on the team that um, basically handled downloads and made sure that stuff was fast. Um, there's so much pre-processing and things going on behind the scenes. Like nothing is fast. There's like nothing like crazy, although a lot of engineering work goes into it that makes it their videos or anything easier to download than than yours. Um, but there's all this like black magic behind the scenes of like making the user think it's loaded even when it's not loaded and stuff. Um, so, so this really scales even to like Instagram scale of like a few billion DAU. Okay, so most software just needs to work and be fast enough, i.e. respond to users in less than 200 milliseconds. This is not that hard up to a few million DAU. Yeah, again, using these things, think you can go really fast. Um, yeah, and what is speed, man? Like who cares if, if your thing works in a few nano seconds users for the most part are like pretty lenient as long as it's not blocking them not to mention that most of these test scenarios won't be comparable enough to what you're actually building to give stat sig answers um, and yeah this is true with all benchmarks they all have asterisks and for the most part it's going to be impossible to cover all the cases that your business cares about or that matches your workflow so in the end you kind of just gotta uh, measure your own systems to get a real answer on things so this means that these benchmarks are largely not that important outside of a few areas avoiding lemons some languages are so slow that you should avoid them and entirely, <laughs> Ruby, uh, other ones like that. And then nanosecond sensitive areas. Some areas are very affected by tiny perf changes like big video games, um, high frequency trading, hard science number calcs, like simulations of black holes or decades of supply chains. Um, yeah, like I, I think there's definitely some areas that super care about this, like the big video games like Starfield and Cyberpunk, you know, everyone's up in arms when like Cyberpunk like is crashing their computers when they run on Ultra. And it's like, the truth is high level graphics are really hard to do and they take a lot of compute. And so if you want a game as beautiful as Cyberpunk, you're gonna have to be able to do the computation yourself. Um, same as Starfield, everyone was mad, I think when it was like locked at 30 FPS and I was like, you know, just be lucky that it runs. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, like this, this is hard computing here. I think video games is one of the hardest um, areas of computing because of this visceral like user reaction where like 200 milliseconds is actually not enough. One of the few areas. High frequency trading, obviously, you know, if you get in like a thousandth of a second early, you get a better price and get a lot of money. Um, and then these hard science number calcs are interesting because they're not, they don't necessarily need to be fast, but they're just doing so much data that it's crazy. Um, I always thought that this was false, but uh, actually fast F sharp, who if you're into F sharp, go look at his videos, they're great. Um, talks about, in one of his videos where he says um, he uses F sharp for like simulations and he was saying that for him getting like 10x faster is actually very important because it goes from being able to have people quickly simulate the next 10 years of like supply chain which I think is what he does now in that same amount of time like a few seconds they can do a hundred years um, which allows them to really have a lot more power in what they're doing um, so like in a lot of areas like if your web request goes like 10x faster 
it's like 200 milliseconds to 20 milliseconds, it doesn't really matter. You still have to register and like do things, but maybe in a simulation thing where you're trying about a bunch of different combinatorial inputs, it, it could matter. Um, so I thought that was interesting and kind of broke my, uh, or added another area to things that I guess could be very, you know, nanosecond sensitive. All right, so why are your benchmark is wrong? Okay, so I've already laid out why I think your benchmark isn't that useful in reality, but I haven't explained why your benchmark is wrong. The main reason is that it's missing the largest factor in terms of software speed. So just as big O is bounded on the largest factor, if your benchmark does not include the largest factor in terms of speed, then it will also be wrong. Yeah, so for anyone that doesn't know big O, big O is basically like what they use in programming language interviews. Um, and it's basically a rule of thumb for how many operations need to happen to do something. Um, and it's kind of useful because it kind of bounds stuff, but there's always this disconnect between the theory of big O, like how many operations do you need and the actual speed of things, because the speed of things, right, depends on different um, programming languages, oftentimes like what CPU are you on? Can you like miss branch predictions or whatever? Um, but big O is usually a, like, it's almost like an abstraction on top of that that makes it easier to talk about. Um, so anyway, big O is always bound on the largest factor. So if you have an N cubed, if you have like an N squared or like even an N on there, you just take the biggest factor, in this case N cubed and focus on that. So this is what I'm saying here. When I think of the speed of a given programming language, I typically think of it in two buckets. So the user perspective, how fast does your thing work? and that's that's what we're talking about here um, and previously in this post or measured and this is measured in milliseconds seconds or worst case hours for like big data job like the simulations I was talking about so the user perspective and then the business or builder perspective so how fast does it take to build um, and this is often measured in days weeks and months and then the worst case years for like huge projects um, yeah and so these are things like tickets and your Jira board or like you know things that need to get done add a new feature change a calculation testing all sorts of stuff like that I'm and so build time is the amount of time to actually build the thing. And then maintenance time is like the amount of time to maintain the thing. So adding, changing features, fixing bugs, keeping lights on, stuff like that. And yeah, if you have read any of these like books, they're always like, hey, you maintain software more than you build software. Um, and this is largely true because, you know, you're very rarely building something from scratch. There's always going to be something you have to plug into, whether it's like, you know, you're building a feature on top of core libraries that already, already exist. Or um, even if you have a new service, you're still got to plug into the services that already exist for your company. So this is really the, the big bounding one that, that people forget about a lot. We kind of have the user perspective down by measuring speed of operations. Though this is still debatable as largely your bound will be on how you architect the pieces together, hello big O, and that most users think in terms of boundaries. It's either slow enough to be noticeable or fast enough. Yeah, so this is always the problem with those, those benchmarks. They don't actually do the scenario you want. Um, and then even if they do, they're often like micro benchmarks. So it's like, hey, this thing does this math so fast. Um, but then when you plug it into your system you can always like do the math wrong or you architect it weird where we're doing the math like in squared times which now makes it common or exponentially slower um so i always think architecture is like huge that's why big o's get to think about um and then again yeah this most users think in terms of uh, boundaries like when you visit a website or something like you're not checking how many milliseconds this stuff takes it's it's either feels slow or it feels fast enough right like you're never like oh my god this thing loaded so fast no it's like it either loaded too slow or it's fine um yeah and so it's this more macro thing that actually actually matters, I think, in, in our software. But we're missing the business builder perspective, which I'd posit is the larger factor and thus the bottleneck in terms of programming language speed. Whereas the user perspective is certainly important in terms of the usability of your software, the business perspective is arguably a larger factor. If you never get the thing built in the first place, people can't use it. If your software is not reliable, keeps breaking, people can't use it. The longer your software takes to keep the lights on or build, more money spent from business, less time for improving other things. Yeah, so I would I would argue that like, you know, what people think of and what you ideally you'd be doing as software engineer is you're just building the things in the first place. So you're building the features, you're doing the stuff, you're um, building the cool things. But what actually happens is most companies I've been at, it's never this simple. So it's always like, you know, obviously some things are breaking and hopefully not most of your time isn't spent firefighting. If so, got to focus on that. But even even if like it's you're not things aren't breaking, it's like, hey, I want to build this new thing, but things already exist. So I actually have to do a lot of work to change the underlying system so that this thing can be built reasonably and I have to do a lot of work to make sure that my new thing doesn't break the thing existing and I'd probably say it's like a 30 30 30 like percentile of where your time goes which is why even if like you're in a good system or software most systems they just like aren't built that composably um, here yeah and so you still spend a lot of time on it okay a better benchmark so what would the ideal benchmark take into account ideally it would take into account each of these parts the user perspective and this would be the performance on common end-to-end -end workflows, ideally, I guess, close to the things that you're 
you're already using in your own system. Uh, build perspective, the build time, so the time to actually build the workflow, and then the maintenance time, time to maintain or evolve the work. Um, I guess I should probably call this out in the post, like what a workflow is, but this is kind of like the domain driven design version of like what you're trying to do with a piece of software. Um, and if you go really down the functional path and stuff, um, if you do, I guess, domain driven and functional together, you end up with this idea that like everything is a composable brick and then you compose these bricks into what you call workflows, which are things that the business is trying to do. Um, and this is the best way I've, I've found to like architect software from a conceptual level. Um, but that's, that's what a workflow just means here. It's just like the thing you're trying to do, uh, create an order. That's a workflow. This would give us a much better perspective of how programming languages stack up in reality, not just theory. But this is quite hard to do. Each business tool has its own workflows it cares about, which leads to a combinatorial explosion of user scenarios to cover. And no two engineering teams are the same. So the build time would likely vary a lot, even if all the factors were held constant. So I think this is true. So the, the combinatorial explosion of user scenarios to cover is like, you know, even if my create and order for a common workflow takes this long, you can always architect your thing poorly such that it's going to take 20 times as long. Um, so you're going to have to check your own thing. And so this is like, how do we cover all of these objectively? Very hard to do. But you could imagine that maybe you'll come up with some patterns and cover like the most things, I suppose. Now this one is harder. And I think this is the main reason why um, we can't do this. Like, because like, I always think about it. Like people think like, if we just send more engineers at it, it'll be faster. But there's always like, whatever it is, the mythical man month, right? Where I actually think if you, the max team size you can have is about six. Over six, things start to go downhill. Um, and it also depends on the composition of the of this or the composition of six. So I think three senior engineers on a team are gonna completely outperform a team with even two to three senior engineers and like a few juniors just because of the overhead um, that you're working with. Um, and so when you're trying to compare things like Python versus let's say F sharp and, and build time and stuff, it's gonna be really hard because the teams are gonna be different. So it's gonna be skill levels and how proficient they are in the languages. And it's also like hard to get two teams to build the exact same thing. You'd have to make sure that the complexity of the thing that they were building is exactly the same. And that's really hard to do from project to project. Like even if I told two teams to build a to-do list, like those to-do lists are probably gonna be massively different in complexity just because of the architecture that the people came up with. So this is just really hard to do. Um, so uh, the best recommendation I've got for the build perspective is to survey companies that have used different technologies and try to get some patterns out of what they've used, liked and disliked, and ultimately learned from that. And on top of this, like you kind of have to find ones that are similar to your position. Like we always see the ones where it's like, hey, Facebook, you know, forked Python and made it faster because Python wasn't fast enough for them. And it's like, don't do that. Nobody needs to do that. Just build on current Python, work on your business. Don't don't build a new programming language. That's dumb for most people. Um, yet people still take that and, and use it to, to mean something. So um, and then I threw this one in here. Uh, the best pattern I've pulled out of this is static versus over dynamic languages long term. Um, I'll probably get some flack for this, but if there is one pattern that I found uh, across all my companies, and I'll probably make a video or something on this, um, it's that, you know, dynamic languages let you get up to speed relatively fast on the initial builds, but everything that comes after the initial build is like always hamstrung by that shit code that you, you wrote to start with if it's dynamic. Um, and so static languages, everything after that initial build and remember the initial build is like I don't know the first month or two uh, of building this project so everything after that first month or two of that software existing dynamic is worse um, than static and in all my experiences basically the pattern I've read from looking at everything so if there's one recommendation I have to like do this is probably go towards static and, and not dynamic yeah fight me in the comments I'm I'm happy to, to take this this uh, discussion on yep and if you're interested in these traditional user perspective benchmarks you're still a fan of them uh, you can check out some of these other ones I did for TypeScript F sharp and F sharp versus TypeScript and I'll have them linked below. Cool, this is the first version of Hammy Reacts. Let me know how you like this format. Uh, if there's things you'd like me to see or to do different, uh, let me know. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.